Oh, what a mess. Do it how I want to do it. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's Daddy's basement. And what are we celebrating today? Um, a Halloween show. We're it's, having a Halloween show. It will be so much fun. So much fun. What are you dressed up as? I'm I'm dressed up as Iron Man, and Daddy dressed up as a bloody doctor. Do you, do you, uh, do you know why I'm a bloody doctor? Mm, yeah, because everybody puts their red paint on them. <laughs> I'll tell you. Can I tell them why I'm a bloody doctor? Okay. Okay. A couple weeks ago, we had Immersed 2016. You know that, that conference we were working yeah! on? Well, we, you know, we had the conference. We had seven to 9,000 people there, and we killed it. We had a really good conference. Don't worry, we didn't really kill it. Don't worry, don't worry, he's all worried. No, we had a really successful conference. We had seven to 9,000 people there, almost 40 speakers. It was over three days. Very successful. Can I tell you what, what many money do you make at your conference? Okay. In the spirit of Halloween, today we're going to have one of the Immerse 26 present, 2016 presentations. Luc Bilio, CTO, Jean-Philippe Doiron, Technology Director for Freema Studio. And they're going to be talking about the future of play. Lots of fun. Back with more right after this. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. So um, this is going to be the non-serious part of the event, so bear with us. Um, so today we'll be talking about <laughs> one, one person is interested in the part. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the future of play, meaning how we think that children will play in the future. And to do that, uh, we're going to have a look at the best and present evolution of, of play from small um, old wooden toy to smartphone or to like virtual reality headset that we have now. And next we'll look at you know, future technology, and now our forecast technology, how this technology can be mixed and matched together to create the new future of play. And we'll show you some prototypes, some stuff that we've done. And to conclude, we'll actually ask ourselves if doing that is going to stifle our, our kids' uh, creativity. Uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm the CEO of Fremont, and uh, I brought my minion, JP, over here. Yes, master. <laughs> All right, so quick show of hand. Who here has kids? I apologize. Um, who here is still a kid? <laughs> so um, at Fremont, we're doing a digital entertainment for kids and family. So anything from uh, from movies to video games to VR and AR experiences. Now, while looking to, to do this talk, when we were preparing this talk, we stumbled upon this conference from uh, Brian Dacry, uh, augmented reality at that might be a while ago. Oddly enough, the talk is called The Future of Play, and it's actually pretty good, and we thought we could just like play this to you guys and be on our way. The problem is, Neil probably won't agree, and it's only seven minutes long, so I guess we won't do that. But joking aside, uh, he covered some very interesting points, so it's, it's worth uh, to check out. Now, in order to forecast the future, we need to look at the past. So what we did is we dusted off an old video that you see here, right? Uh, from our attic. Um, so good. Uh, to the first jigsaw puzzle in the 1700s, kids only had physical items to play with 
and they used their imagination to paint whatever story they wanted to play with. We've also seen some picture of the yeah, you can go ahead and switch. Some picture of Bard Love, the Viewmaster, which are kind of ancestor of technology that we'll be talking about. But this was about 500 years in, in a minute. Now let's make a big leap forward and look into more recent technology. In 2007, yeah, the iPhone was the new revolution. Then came the 2010, the iPad, and both kind of create a new way to interact with, with our toys. Um, let's have a look at some example of new way to interact with, uh, with our toys with these devices. So with those smart devices, uh, became the, the, the first real, uh, augmented reality experiences. So you know, the QR code based uh, real, uh, augmented reality experiences. So for instance, the Nintendo 3DS had some of those, and the well-known augmented cereal boxes. I really like this one. And as, uh, as the device became more and more powerful, then you could see stuff like this, you know, a virtual coloring book, uh, and uh, Crayola did, uh, did those, Disney and DreamWorks as well did applications like that. I still don't see how the kid's going to be handling the iPad and still writing the same time to see what he does. But anyway, uh, Osmo, they also did kind of a new innovative way to interact with your iPad. They created a, a device that you put on top of your iPad. So when we received it, that device, we we looked into it. We had our R&D team look into the technology behind how the iPad can, can read what you do on the table, and then they told us it was a mirror. Actually, it was, we actually looked at what kind of camera are they using and stuff like that. So it's only a mirror that displays the image right from the, from the front of the table to your iPad. It's clever, it's worked pretty good, um, so that was a good thing. Then came uh, the sky figurine. figuring. Those those figurines, um, well, oddly enough, were created by Activision, which is a video game company and not a toy company. And while they generated billions in revenue, the term Toys to Life or Digital to Physical became kind of a trend. Exactly, and um, toy companies actually look at, 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 at how the kids were using those devices and they, they felt that they became slaves to those new uh, iPod, I, iPhone, and things like that. And they wanted them to go back to the physical play because, well, they're a toy company, so that's what they're selling. And the way that these devices are working is there's an RFID chip into the figurine, there's a reader into the portal, and as you place the figurine into the portal, it unlocks you stuck into your game. Um, but actually, the problem with these figurines is that the, yeah, the problem with these figurines is that the, um, the kids don't actually play with them. They just, they're used to unlock new content into the device. <laughs> However, with, with kind of the new generation, the smart toys, those can interact with your kids. Uh, obviously, they're using bigger computer power. Uh, it records the sounds of your kid to send that to a cloud so that they can make decent and intelligent answer back to the cloud, to the kids. But, yeah, it also raised some privacy and safety concerns. However, we won't talk about this today because it would probably take a whole talk by itself. Um, Enki is letting you uh, control the outcome of a race using your smartphone. So you can shoot missiles at each other and things like that. And on top of that, the physical cars, um, they, they, can, they are aware of the track behind them. Uh, so so they, they can work by themselves as a, as a, as a, tro uh, as a, as a toy and actually Check it out here. Oh, Master. Now they, what they did is they took that old Viewmaster 
and they repurposed it as a, as a uh, VR device. So the only thing you needed to do is put your cell phone into it, and then you had a $30 VR headset. And then we have the high-end. Uh, the high-end headset, of course, the, the first the, the Oculus Kickstarter kind of started the new wave. Uh, VR is not new, as, as you guys all know, but the new wave started by the Kickstarter of Oculus. And um, what HTC did, which was pretty cool, was the room scales. So like, if you try the experience on stairs, a lot of them are room scales, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and this month, uh, Oculus and the Oculus Connect, they announced they would do room scale as well, and the PSVR has just been launched. So we have three uh, major uh, high-end headsets out there. Uh, going back to the room scale, because I think you said it only twice, but like 25 or Um JavaScript is a good example of room scale face variants. It's pretty simple. You can move around your office. You can eat donut, drill donuts, tables, photocopies, stuff like that. Put it on your donuts. Put it on your donuts, yeah. Uh, it's pretty simple. It gives, a, it gives a good idea on how new way to interact with the device can be made. Then, I uh, think that uh, Peter guy, I just can't remember the name, sorry. James, James talked about it a bit. There's a there's the next level of room scale, which we call it, I don't know, free scale, free roam VR. Uh, an example is VR game. VR game, you're using, could be 50 by 50 room with motion capture camera. The, the HMD is actually wireless. It's using Wi-Fi connectivity with a PC, so stream, IM stuff to your, to your headset. And we tried it recently, and it's surprisingly good. I mean, I, my, my concern was the latency, obviously. There are a lot of hardware people, well, latency is not going to work, but actually it worked. It would work pretty fine. Uh, it was, obviously, I was shooting zombies, because this is, this is what we do in gaming. Every new device is a new device to kill zombies, actually. <laughs> and um, play, play a while, it was cool. There's, a, there's also, um, what's the name of it? Zero latency. Zero latency oh, in Australia, which just Pretty much the same thing, but they're using, uh, if I'm correct, they're using backpack. We haven't got a chance to get there because, you know, Australia, pretty far. There's water all around. Yeah, there's the water. And then, <laughs> and then there's the board. Uh, a VR startup in Utah that we tried out earlier this year. Um, what they do is they add the physical environment to the mix. So you have actual walls and bench and things like that, but I'll let you uh, look at it for yourself.
you have to shoot the bugs on the grounds. So when, when we went there um, uh, in January uh, right after CS, we um, so we, we, we strapped the headset and it was one at a time in this experience, but they had also multiple experience. So they bring us in a, in a Mayan temple. So you get into the temple, walk around a little bit, there's a voice that tells you, okay, you know, before you enter the temple, you should sit down a little bit. And you're, you're physically walking, and they're telling you to sit down on that bench. You're like, uh, sure, all right. So you sit down, and there's a physical bench there, so it makes sense. After that, you get up, you go to a corridor, and they have a torch on the wall, and they're like, yeah, it's getting dark out there, so you probably want to go back and grab the torch. So I grab the torch. So you physically grab the torch, and now you have a torch, a virtual torch in your hand, and it's not on the wall anymore. And you feel the physicality of the torch. And of course, we're technical people, so we're kind of looking at every corner, lighting up those corners that were not lighted up before to see what was there. So it was pretty cool. And, and then after that, we go to a platform, put our hand on the platform, and then a Mannion elevator, I don't remember the brand of the elevator, Back in the days, man, probably did some crazy yeah, elevators. So basically, you get an elevator, it brings you uh, probably 10 feet up, and then you get to a waterfall. So you feel the mist, the, the mist of water, the wind, the coldness of the place, and you didn't actually move an inch. They just made the floor vibrate to make you feel like you're going out. So that was pretty cool. They also had uh, the Ghostbuster experience in Pedal to so in New York, which, which we also tried, and was, was as cool as the main cave today. Uh, Meeting with the family as well. Yeah, with the family. It, it is as immersive as. I got two things. First, I was. The, the temple was crumbling down, the floor it was falling, everything was falling apart, and I was walking in there. And, I mean, like, like you said, technical people, we know that there's a floor there, it's virtual reality. So I saw, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna go back. No, nope, no, nope, there's no one gonna go back. So my brain is letting me walk into a floor I know is there. Another thing, Curtis from the boy told us a certain moment that there was a there was a, a woman who was experiencing virtual reality for the first time, and then there, there's a stage there, and they had a little a little bump in a, a mud of, of water, and she died. She just <laughs> onto the floor. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, she's all right. It was kind of. A little bit funny though. <laughs> there, yeah, there's also a cool innovation that is worth talking about on the void. They are using redirected walking, meaning that even if you think you are walking into a straight line, we're actually, you're actually turning in a circle. So you then, in a 60 by 60 uh, environment, you can walk four miles without even figuring that out. So using the same physical room, you can create multiple rooms. So giving the Correct processing power, you can create an entire city within a gymnasium, which yeah. is amazing. That's pretty cool. Uh, the thing that moves is actually the, uh, the physical space, and the thing that doesn't move is the virtual space, and you can probably extend it you know, as, as, as far as you can. Um, so, everything that we will show you next is not commercially available at this time. So, what we do is we take existing technologies and we assume that in the near future, they'll be faster, cheaper or this, more that. For instance, the HoloLens. The HoloLens is available right now, commercially. Uh, you can buy it, but I doubt any family will actually buy a $3,000 US or $4,000 Canadian device. So it's not viable today. Now we also look into other technology like the uh, Intel RealSense, which we can buy it today, but we can stock it with different elements to be able to do more than the element was designed for. The broader example would be, um, I would take um, like, Per per van see through capability. I'll put that into a I don't know maybe a star VR, super large field of new rendering using the vibe tracking technology or the the whole lens inside out tracking. This is kind of what we're talking about when we say about mixing technology to be able to forecast what it will be in the future. Yeah, another small example is take a look at the which the video that we'll have. We took a small diecast. That gas car, which is, we'll say it's decently old technology. We had it, uh, a Wi Fi, an IMU, a Bluetooth, and an iPad, and we can create experience like this. It's a silent video, it looks like. So you can do uh, 360 uh, positioning on the, on the car. You'll see great. 
Yeah, so compared to uh, the Scotty Nerf, for instance, it, it's one of the other ideas that we, like, that we like that toy company are also looking into is bringing back the kids to the physical play. And this, what we call toys and controller, is one way to do it. Now, this is, this is our office. Not all of it, because it's a part of our office. But we want you to see, to see it like, like this. Yes, thank you. Yes, exactly. Remember when we talked about the void? where you have the physical space and then you move around uh, uh, physically and, and the environment change according, the virtual environment change according. We want this in your living room, in your office, here in this room, anywhere you want. So we want that cat built to be here. Now, in, in terms of the void, for instance, in terms of what the void is using to create this, we need a little bit more. Uh, we need inside out tracking. Um, we need it to be wireless, good or wireless. We need depth sensing capabilities so that you're able to sense the depth of the wall so that we can, you know, like remap something on top of it. And ideally, we wanted everything to be wireless. Yes. Now, uh, this is our office. Again, you know, with walls, ceilings, you know, stuff like that. Right? This is our office. Now, we want to remove all those walls, even the physical walls, in your virtual environment. So, we, for instance, we want a, a lush forest to appear in front of you. And, uh, or, or an ocean on the left where there's a big wall in your office, do you feel like there's no, uh, uh, there, it's not a, a small constrained space anymore? And uh, in order to do that, of course, we don't want you to run into your wall, so we'll, we'll add maybe a pile of rock on your left and maybe a, a, a row of bushes on your right so you don't, you don't hit the walls. But what is cool about, about gaming, about game design, or gaming and game design, is that we can do pretty much whatever we want with a virtual reality. So even though the camera doesn't see a wall which is like 30 feet away, so we see a large forest, we see an ocean, we see something, but as we get closer to the wall, the camera does detect a wall, and as it detects the walls, magic, we can have three growing in one second, but we can have walls falling from the sky, <laughs> that just define the environment. So, yeah, that would be cool. It would. Coming to a headset theory. Okay. When we first tried to create that that idea, the headset like just didn't exist to be able to do that. We they're all they were the best were were tethered or they didn't have uh, capabilities to do deep uh, reading uh, stuff like that. Now recently we see more of the kind of the middle headset. Uh, for instance, there's a project Deloitte from Intel, which is untethered, depth sensing, inside eye tracking. There's Santa Cruz as well uh, from Oculus. There's also Sulan, uh, a Toronto based company that does inside out tracking and uh, depth reading as well. So, it, well, from our point of view, really worth giving that a try to do our prototype that we want to do. Exactly. So we have choices now instead of doing duct tape and uh, 3D print, uh, printed mounts and stuff like that to add what we needed. Um, so what we want to do in the next, the next generation of augmented reality and uh, how kids could actually play with that. So in this example, in the video you're going to see what we wanted to do is take a figurine. Uh, in our case, it's a Yoda clock, like a Lego Yoda clock. Uh, it was big enough for the for the uh, depth sensing and all that. So we want that figurine to act as a referee for a robot battle. So wherever the kid would put the, fig the figurine with the AR headset, then the battle would be right in front. And you can check it out. No, you can't check it out yet. So in order to do that, we needed a joint reality headset. So we took the whole lens. Uh, but we did uh, raw data for uh, for detection of the figurine, and the whole the whole lens does not uh, does not provide that. Information. So we added a 3D mount with an Intel RealSense camera for, for depth information. Not the RealSense camera, it needs a USB connectivity. And the whole lens doesn't have that. So we added a processing stick right here that has USB, awesome. Um, but that thing needs power, and the whole lens can provide power to it. We wanted everything to stay wireless. Exactly. So we added a power pack. With a kind of modified wires here to get enough power to that stick. Yeah, it probably lasted like five minutes before it worked out or something. Um, but it worked. Um, and then those just uh, uh, formatted. Uh, in the video, you'll see a robot, a small little robot, robot. Those were put in our uh, left and uh, right arm, and they were tracking our position. So the, the robot arm were moving accordingly. In our definition of wireless, these doesn't count. 
<laughs> no, exactly. Uh, it's a it's a wireless with wire uh, setup. <laughs> All right, this seems good. Now please stand and go to click the red box. First detection done. Call detection one. complete. They added two detections. <laughs> <laughs>
insane. There's nothing I experienced like that. That's amazing. That's like the best thing I've ever seen in the past. Hands down. These are moments that kind of drive us forward. Obviously, we're capitalizing on first time experience of VR user, but that, that part of the game was not an easy ride. There was some exploration and exploration, kind of things we don't do in VR, but we did. And it's a first person player game anyway. Um, but adding, adding all the attic, it, it actually it helped. It helped a lot not to, be, to feel disoriented. Yeah, I agree with JB, and, and we were both there to see most of these reactions. And it's pretty awesome when you see people living those uh, those experiences, and, and like some of them we thought they were actually going to die right in front of us, or you know, they were looking it back and saying, telling their their virtual family, "It's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. I hope Daddy will save you, or Mommy will save you." It's like that. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we're still in contract working with the one who dies, so I don't, I want you guys to talk about it. Nice. <laughs> um, so. What we see at the next evolution of haptic feedback, though, is for you to get into a suit like this, yeah, uh, or similar to this, and um, the suit would check, track your movement and uh, interact with the, with the game or the experience, just like a, a motion capture suit. But not only we want the suit to do that, but we want the suit to, um, to restrict your movement. So for instance, if in the virtual world there's a table in front of you, the suit will block your movement as you touch the virtual table. So you can just imagine how immersed you can be uh, with a suit like that. Yeah, um, with this not only you'll be able to feel the table, it will try not to break your arms, and you'll, but you'll be able to walk and run, and actually feel the burden of walking up the stairs. And yesterday AJ asked, uh, AJ asked a question, what is this our, I'll call it a wet dream of virtual reality in a couple of years, uh, people like it. You know we're filmed, right? Yeah, mine is, um, my is, I want to be Iron Man. I'm a gamer. I want to be in Fallout 4. I want to have a power on or 500 pounds of equipment and be walking into the wasteland and actually feeling it. Remember playing a game called Red Dead Redemption and they, they built an amazing weather system. It was, was gorgeous. And I was playing on my TV, on my screen, and I actually stopped while riding a horse to look at the sunset and it was gorgeous. I just want to be able to feel it. Then of the video. Yes, and we think it's gonna happen soon enough. Yeah, and, and that, that dream, that future with with Apple is not so far away. There's already some some company that's all working on that, like for instance, Axon VR and Z. Okay. Then on plug. So Neil, we're out of time. Now there's like not only that they have resistance and motion control like we talked about, but they also they also have that skin technology that makes you feel the, the heat and the cold and the little sort of subtle movement of a spider in your hand. And when we tried this, it was like, yes, this is the future of active feedback for anything virtual reality or not. I want that to be plugged in every house. I want Ready Player One to have that feature. And, and it's just cool. But they have to. Definitely. Um, all of these experiences require very um, high uh, realistic graphics. And in VR, well, you have to render for two eyes. And not only that, but you have to, uh, you have to render twice as fast as the speed of, uh, of the new AAA games. So that's you know, technically very hard on, on a system. So either you need a very powerful system, or you need to find a solution for that, those type of problems. One solution that is out there, people are working on it, it's called weighted rendering. You heard about it um, last two days, probably on Sunday. Um, research shows, and actually this is Microsoft research that works on that, it shows that the eyes only perceive 3% of the actual screen. So if you can figure out exactly where your eyes is looking, you can drastically increase the rendering quality, you can reduce our perception, you can do all of that by just rendering the quality of the other 97% of the rendering, which is amazingly huge. Um, headset companies are most most of them are claiming that they will add that to their next I don't know next the next one of them maybe the next one after that but um, we've tried a full VR this one and uh, these guys are gonna release a dev kit by the end of the year ish so uh, so it's it's coming now let's take a step back you know we're showing cool technology and all that stuff 
and uh, we were in a meeting at the office, and we were talking about augmented, you know, the, the castle where the, the virtual dragons come on your physical castle, and the kids were like, oh my god, this is crazy. And one of the guy, this guy, uh, he's a he's a technical director at Fremont, um, he kind of got up and said, oh man, guys, this this is very awesome. This project's very awesome. But you know, in my days, what you guys were portraying was called imagination. So like, yeah, it's, it's pretty funny. But at the same time, we stopped and we, we kind of thought about it a little bit and said, are we really, with all those technologies and, and all those new innovation, are we stifling the kids' imagination? Are we removing it from them in, in a way? Um, so we're taking you back, way back. You know, back in the days, in the beginning of times, people used to tell stories over a fire. So our imagination was used to figure out if the dragon was red or the dragon was black, or if the hero was tall or if the hero was small. Uh, was small. Yeah, then after the stories came the drawing. Is there any artist in the room? Amazing art. No, but somebody here talked about the... Yeah, it came, came the picture. It came the picture. So. After the stories, drawing. In drawing came the... You see there, there's a little man hunting with a bow, a deer. Uh, so... Sure, JP. On the yeah, yeah, right there. So, people were not, they, they do not, at that point, they did not imagine the, the deer, the horse, because it was pictured somewhere. But then they can create their own environment. So they, they want to imagine, imagine, something like that. Uh, with the young thing in the big forest, like all green, blue skies, firestorms, stuff like that. Then those stories became books where not only characters, but places, environment were described or even pictured. So what was left for imagination, it was to figure out, for instance, how the horse were moving, or how happy Cinderella was when, when her father came with a new family. So, um, but finally came movies. So with movies, all of that was, was in front of us. So what, what's left for our imagination? And how does all of this, including the new technology, affect our imagination? Well, there is a research say, from Lancaster University that says that kids who watch magical content on, well, say, Harry Potter perform better in creativity and imagination tests after they have watched that magical content. So they make simple experiments, like um, find a way to place that plastic cup into a bin, or tell me a story about this plastic cup. And those kids who watch that magical content had funnier idea, more creative idea. So now, Make sure we're not saying that watching TV will get your kid more imagination, but what we're saying is that studies show that it really all depends on the content itself. Yeah, exactly. So the key in augmented the kids' reality is to use inspirational content. So this will not replace, but it will stimulate their imagination by providing them uh, material that they can later use in their active play. During the talk, uh, we showed you new innovation, new technology, um, and it provided us new ways to interact with toys, new control mechanism like the car and things like that, new medium for content, VR, AR, and all that cool stuff. Um, so on our side, we'll keep looking forward because if we think that those technologies, um, they can provide our children with tools to create their own stories. And for us, that's the future of play. Thank you. Any questions? If I pick up that phone, that red phone, what's going to happen? Only the president. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, so I'll just shout it out. So obviously, you guys have tried like a lot of cool gadgets. You know, how soon do you think we'll actually be able to, you know, experience those? You know, as a widely available medium. Okay, um, so it depends which one you're talking about. Is the void the full body one? Oh, okay, the full, yeah. yeah. Our, our, our wet dream, you mean? Your wet dream, yeah. Um, um, we, see your wet dream. we can't say uh, much about it, but we're working with companies that have expertise in that to uh, make it happen, to at least make a prototype uh, that could be showcased at some point. Uh, but I, I, I doubt they will be commercially available no. within the next five years, and maybe three if you are an entertainment park that are willing to they they but but you, you understand the challenge behind not breaking people's bones. Yes. Person back? Yeah, uh, so with the full body haptic, you know, immersion, 
you guys see any potential dangers of that as well? Of course. A lot. If, yeah. If you have a motor, for instance, uh, then you can break bones and you don't want that to happen. If you're able to only block movements, just stop it, then there's less issues. Uh, but then again, it's a suit. You have to you have to put it on, and you know, I, I, there's several issues. At the same time, on our side, we want to look kind of forward, uh, three, five, ten years. So for us, we don't care about these things. Well, we care about breaking bones, not yours, but I care about mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but not only yeah, there's drawback, obviously. But we've seen at recent CES uh, this year that they're they're out, they are using exoskeleton like this for um, for old people or Letting you feel how old people feel when they actually walk because they're adding resistance to your bone. They're also using that for therapy to get you back on your feet. Literally, when you got injuries and stuff like that. Yes, there's a lot of drawbacks, so security is a ma major concern for other people. We just want to play with it. Everything is moving fast, so we're happy. We're here. So for mass kind of entertainment experience, it hasn't come up in the last few days that I've heard, but is anybody thinking about accessibility issues? I mean, if someone comes in a wheelchair, does that mean they can't get to play in VR at all because they can't run space? Well, I sure hope they, they would. And actually, VR, I think, is a is a great medium for 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 any disability. If if you're if you're in a wheelchair, you can still wear a headset and be transported in places you might not be able to go. You know, otherwise, actually, the first Star VR Star Wars experience was a, a walking dead experience, and it was in a wheelchair. True. You, you are sitting physically to a wheelchair to put you the helmet and there are people who are pushing you into the game. But, no. but this, well, this was a game that doesn't help accessibility. But I, I don't think that there's something that is currently do something that is currently that we currently do that will reduce the accessibility. But I'm not sure there's people working specifically on that. Yeah, so for instance, if we have a, a suit that, you, that some people can only wear the, the top, and the, you know, they can't wear the legs because they, can, they can't feel their legs, for instance, then that, yeah, I, I, I agree that that's an issue in, in those cases. So for that, uh, it's going to be part of the next arc next year, we want that thing that you can in your brain somewhere, and it gives you all, you know, all that feeling, which, which would be quite awesome for, for everyone. Perfect. Yeah. So. Oh, I'm that's all the time we have. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. Uh, so I'm a six-year-old. Um, what's the best physical toy uh, to buy a six-year-old for Christmas? <laughs> Why is he asking us this question? <laughs> I have tons of Lego in my basement, and my kids are older, so she can you can come in my house and grab some of them. Oh, that, that has technology in it, you know, because you showed the, the little cars and everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, well, the cars are not available, there's yeah. no product for that, that we think it would be quite cool. I'm sure your six-year-old has, has done VR, if not, you know, the Viewmaster or the Cardboard, uh, they're <laughs> accessible for seven and up, so uh, so that would be definitely something for them. And you are working on a small robot, very bright small robot that you have. You can I, you can feel his feeling when he's sad and he's happy when he do stuff. But uh, you should look into it. It's a it's a smart device that they've put a lot of R and D effort into it, and I'm looking forward to it. But I'm not sure it's going to be available for this Christmas. Sorry. Yep. Have you done any work with Mayat in Montreal, the um, the, the uh, fabric technology company that sent has sensors built into fabrics? We we have not. We've tried the Axon Axon VR, which is a similar fabric-like uh, haptic device uh, to, to give you feeling heat and cold, for instance. Uh, but we haven't we haven't worked with that. What's the name again? Mayan. Mayan. Mayan with okay. a Mayan with a T on the end. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll look it up. We can do it. We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Halloween, everybody. Bye. See you next week. See you next week. <laughs>